Hi guys, my name is Amish Tripathi and I am the director of uh, the Nehru Center. The Nehru Center is the cultural wing of the Indian High Commission uh, in the UK and we uh, we have been in existence for many decades and we organize wonderful events at this very auditorium uh, which is in Mayfair in central London. Sadly as you can see the auditorium is empty. It has been empty uh, since we were all uh, put into lockdown uh, due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, but what we Indians believe is that the other side of a crisis is an opportunity. And what we have done at the Nehru Center is moved all our events online. So now if you attend our online events, every single seat is a VIP seat. Like you get a front row uh, at our events, no trouble of parking, no trouble of traveling all the way. Uh, and most practically all the programs that we would do like uh, literary discussions and, and and uh, dance performances, musical performances, we are doing them all uh, on our online uh, channels. You can register at, uh, for our newsletter at our uh, website, uh, nehrucenter.org.uk. You don't need to write them down. They will be displayed at the bottom of the screen. You can also come to our uh, Facebook page, which is a verified page, the Nehru Center. You can follow uh, updates on all our events on uh, Twitter as well, the Nehru Center, that's also a verified account. Or you can come to our YouTube channel, again, the Nehru Center. We are uh, nothing if not consistent. Uh, I hope you do uh, come to our online channels and enjoy uh, the events that we are putting up for you. Uh, thank you so much for all your love and support. Namaste. Jai Hind. Namaste. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on this uh, wonderful sunny day in London. Uh, and I'm very, very delighted with the program that we are uh, putting up today because the way I see it, uh, the task of the Nehru Center, our remit, is to bring across uh, unknown stories and narratives uh, of India to you. And there is a narrative that has been spoken of about India, uh, sadly, not just in India, but abroad uh, as well, uh, that the story of the last thousand years is a story of successive defeats uh, of uh, Indians, uh, uh, you know, to foreign invaders, first the Turks uh, and then the Europeans. And this is a narrative that many Indians have absorbed into their mind as well, uh, because that's what our books taught us. That's what our education system taught us. Whereas the actual fact is, is far more nuanced and in fact, radically different, actually. Uh, because India is the only pre-Bronze Age culture that is still alive uh, till today. Those same invaders who came to India went to many other parts of the world as well. And they wiped out most of the, the ancient uh, cultures. You call them pagan, idol worshipping, goddess worship, whatever. Most of the ancient cultures, they were all wiped out. But India is still standing. So the story of the last thousand years is in fact not a story of just successive defeats. It is the story of heroic resistance of our Indian ancestors who never surrendered, who kept fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting with the result that our culture is alive uh, till today. There were many great heroes and dynasties, uh, King Suhail Dev, the Rayas of Vijayanagar, uh, the Ahom, so many who have sadly been ignored in our history books. And among the greatest uh, uh, fighters of the resistance uh, were the Marathas, uh, whose story has also been airbrushed, regrettably, out of Indian history books and uh, the understanding of Indian history in uh, Western history books as well, which is why we are so honored and delighted uh, to put across to you uh, through this program today one of the foremost scholars on uh, the epoch of Maratha history, who's written wonderful books, uh, easy readable history books, uh, which uh, take a scholarly insight into this very, very important uh, Maratha era. It must be understood that the British did not conquer India from the Mughals. Uh, they actually conquered India from the Marathas because the Marathas had already conquered much of India back uh, from the Mughals. Uh, and to take you through this uh, program. I leave you to the host Amit Paranjpe, my friend and a brilliant uh, thinker who's going to 
guide this program with of course dr uday kulkarni and with uh, dr cooper as well thank you uh, thanks a lot amish for hosting us uh, it's an honor for me personally to host this program uh, for the nehru center and of course talk to my very good friend dr uday kulkarni and uh, dr randolph cooper so let's uh, let's let's get started right away first of all good evening to all our viewers in india and good afternoon to the viewers uh, in uk Uh, and i'm hoping we have some user uh, viewers from uh, us as well so first of all i am amit paranspe you can find me on twitter at a paranspe and for those active on twitter try to send in some questions uh, we have a packed schedule here so i may not be able to include many of them but do try to send in some questions for dr kulkarni so this program we will be talking to two very senior historians dr uday kulkarni and dr randolph cooper who is joining us from uh, from the uk Uh, both of them have done some great work on the 18th and 19th century maratha and indian history and i'll be uh, briefly introducing that uh, when i introduce uh, introduce both of them today right now uh, in the 18th century india as uh, amish mentioned marathas were the dominant powers and territories that they con- controlled or their influence extended all the way from peshawar in the north to tanjavur shirangapatnam in the south and from present day gujarat to uh, uh, you know present day bengal uh, there are various estimates that it's uh, it's uh, fair to say that up to 3/4 of uh, india was under their direct or indirect control at at that point of time now many have heard about the battle of panipat as well in 1761 and there is this uh, perception that that was the end of maratha power but that's not really the case yes marathas lost that battle but uh, they came back uh, very strong in less than a decade and that was not really the setback uh, that that uh, affected them for the long term uh, if you go back to the beginning of the 18th century the first half of 18th century saw a rapid expansion of maratha power under the leadership of uh, peshwa bajirao who was uh, the father of uh, peshwa nana saheb uh, nana saheb uh, took on from the swarajya that was established by bajirao so we 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 Uh, regularly say here that uh, chatrapati shivaji maharaj the great established the swarajya uh, of marathas uh, uh, here in and around pune and that was expanded into a samrajya first by peshwa bajirao and then later by peshwa nana saheb so the nana saheb era saw uh, the maximum expansion of uh, the maratha empire and the book that dr uday kulkarni has written that we will be talking about specifically talks about this era this era was very complex as the marathas were expanding all over india they ran into a variety of different powers these included local powers like uh, like the nizam but uh, also uh, the europeans uh, like the english and the french and dr kulkarni's book really explains this complex uh, history complex period of history where too many parallel threads were happening at the same time and uh, he has put together those in a very very nice uh, nice fashion and we will hear about that from him i'll make one more point on on dr kulkarni's earlier work he started uh, writing history about a decade back when he wrote his popular book solstice at uh, panipat that presented uh, to the uh, readers first time a good uh, balanced view of what happened there he followed it up with uh, a book on bajirao and he is now going in a chronological order so now he has done the nana saheb book and uh, hopefully by early next year he'll have his next book uh, uh, on madhorao who was the son of uh, uh, nana saheb uh, just to give you a brief introduction of dr uday kulkarni uh, many of our viewers already know him but uh, he is uh, a great polymath he is a doctor uh, graduated from the armed forces medical college uh, and then served in the indian navy for over 15 years after uh, leaving the navy he started his own private practice and uh, over the last 10 or 12 years as i mentioned he has become uh, a historian and has uh, given us uh, four excellent books uh, he has also done uh, many things on the side including a diploma in journalism uh, he excelled at that as well so there are there are too many things that uh, he has he has done over the years and he's excellent at 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 what he does uh, his history writing has been uh, phenomenal in terms of the sheer number of references that he has scanned through the places that he has visited the sources especially the sources that were not discovered uh, till date 
uh, including many rare documents that were sitting in libraries and archives in the UK. He's discovered those. And uh, he's put together this book. Now, let me quickly, before uh, we start with the program, let me quickly introduce our other uh, guest, Dr. Randolph Cooper. And uh, Dr. Cooper has a very interesting background as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll briefly mention how I got first introduced to Dr. Cooper through his book. Uh, this was over 15 years back when I uh, got uh, his book. That time I was in the US, and uh, his book was published in the UK. It was uh, about the Second Anglo-Maratha Wars, and you'll hear about that uh, uh, in his his discussion. Uh, and it was it's a phenomenal piece of work, uh, and we'll we'll talk about that. Dr. Randolph is a graduate from University of Toronto, and he has uh, done his PhD from the University of Cambridge. His thesis was specifically focused on cross-culture conflict, as focused upon the warfare between the British and the Marathas. In 1989, he published an article in the International History Review entitled Wellington and the Marathas, and its revisionist tone set the standard for much of his later work in challenging the assumptions that had been laid down by many British historians, the imperial historians uh, and the history writers in the past. Uh, he spent two years teaching military history for the US Army as well. Uh, in 2003, Cambridge University Press released his book entitled The Anglo-Maratha Campaigns and the Contest of India, The Struggle for Control of the South Asian Military Economy. It's a long title, but you'll, you'll hear about this book. And it's very relevant to Maratha history because it challenged that imperial history, as I mentioned, and uh, veritably set the cat among the pigeons for those who thought they could still say that British victories over the Marathas could be attributed to Western military superiority. That was not really the case. Uh, if you if you read Dr. Cooper's book, you you will understand that uh, in 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 detail, right? So, uh, Dr. Cooper is also a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society for more than twenty years. Uh, but his most recent work is focused on defense economics and the future of American military force structure. So there's just a lot of different things. Uh, today we will hear from him as well. Now. Uh, let, let's start with the program. The flow will be Dr. Uday Kulkarni will talk about the book for about 20, 25 minutes and give an overview and highlight some of the common themes. Uh, then Dr. Cooper will do his presentation in about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, both talk about his book as well as his uh, insights about Dr. Uday's uh, book. And then I'll moderate a Q&A between, between both of them. right? Uh, and as I said, do send in the questions on Twitter. I'll see if I can include some of them. We already have a lot of questions uh, lined up for them. So with that, without taking too much time, Uday, uh, over to you. And uh, for the generous introduction, and it is a pleasure to be here with the Nehru Center in London. It's uh, erudite director, Abhish Tripathi, Dr. Randolph Cooper, who I've greatly admired since I read his brilliantly researched book. Uh, and of course, my friend Amit, and all the viewers who have logged on uh, on this channel today. Now, as Amish mentioned earlier, the long history of India is indeed very fascinating, but it is at as well as central. You cannot just write a deadly centric history for India. And although the rise and fall of empires are inevitable as the tides of the sea, each leave their mark. And they have together created the India that we see today. Now, I will go the old fashioned way and uh, I will immerse, I have immersed myself in narrative history, in the political history, the military history of the times. I believe that narrative history is the bedrock on which all other histories can be based. Uh, in fact, going back to who can be called the father of uh, narrative history, I would say Leopold von Ranke, he laid the basics of historiography when he said that the primary sources are very important and narrative history is again very important and this was the basis of history writing for a very long time. In India, we find that Sir Jan belonged to this school of history as did the senior historian R.C. Muzumdar and I think R.C. Muzumdar had once quoted the at age that history is after all nothing but past politics and uh, but when historians indulge in writing about the history of the times they uh, write in accordance with the way the political winds are blowing and this is what he labels 
as history is present day politics. We have to divorce ourselves from these political winds and look at history as it really happened. And that is where the true test of a historian actually comes in. Otherwise, what we find is uh, something like what court historians used to write, which were basically just histories to uh, get, uh, I mean, their side of the bread buttered. And they have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Now, when the historian selects his sources and he sheds his biases to the extent possible, we're close to what actually happened around that time. And in my case I actually began to I was reading about it all along but I began to write about it because I felt I had to correct the balance of history the way it was being presented the way some parts of it were being ignored or, or if you will being suppressed and these are the parts which have to be brought out so in my own modest way I began this journey about 10 years back and uh, here we are today so let's go back uh, in the last say 800 years we'll find that India changed up till, up till that point in time, it was a culture, it was a cultural ferment, new ideas were coming into the country, society was changing as ideas came. And around that time, uh, if I may say so, that uh, India changed from a culture to a civilization. In the sense, I say civilization because civilization is a more rigid organization, it, it is not so open to change. And again, at around the same time, when invasions began, uh, from the Northwest and these people, these invaders brought their own culture, their own beliefs and for several centuries, I would say, large parts of the country and its natives labored under what was palpably foreign rule. So the foreign rulers, for sure, they lived on into this country and uh, but they harked back to their beliefs, which uh, they brought with them. And uh, they tried to impose them on the uh, uh, original natives of this country. And this reached its final extreme stage in the second half of the 17th century during the time of uh, Aurangzeb. And it was at that time that the several revolts that were taking place against this kind of rule were ruthlessly crushed. Uh, a friend of mine who has said that 22 of these revolts which happened in those 50 years were ruthlessly crushed and the one which could not be crushed, it was not really a revolt, uh, was the one which was started by Chhatrapati Shivaji and it was Chhatrapati Shivaji who forged these 18 so-called communities or castes of the state into a single union uh, which kind of united together to forge itself into a new state and this was the state of the Marathas and with its own king and its own ministers. And that was what happened in the second half of the 17th century. The story of the Marathas actually begins from that point in time. So let us look at the difference that happened in about 50 or 60 years. You can compare in the left side, the map of the Mughal Empire, Akbar's time till 1605. And then uh, for about 20 years of the last 20 years of the 17th century, it extends down till the southern parts of uh, the peninsula. And rapidly, after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, you find that the Mughals uh, regressed as the Marathas expanded. It was the momentum of the Marathas built up over this long war of 26 years that they waged against Aurangzeb, which carried them across the Narmada and into the north. And uh, the, ground, uh, the, the Mughal emperor at that by the 1750s, if you see, it was a puppet, it was a phantom, and actually it, was, it no longer mattered who sat on the throne. As early as 12 years after the death of Aurangzeb, the Maratha forces were already in Delhi. And this groundwork between 1720 and 1740 was laid down by Bajirao Peshwa. And that actually converted a small kingdom into an empire. Now, the Indian world during this entire period was rapidly changing polar world of the Mughals to a bipolar world and rapidly after 1719 the Mughals disintegrated. It was Bajirao's attack on Delhi in 1737 which probably prompted Nadir Shah to start thinking that the Mughals have become very weak. But it was also an invitation by some of the nobles in the Mughal court who asked Nadir Shah to come to Delhi 
and 1739 you find that whatever was left of the mughal power was destroyed between these two rulers you can see the difference uh, in their approach towards empire and towards uh, towards their attack on delhi when bajirao came to delhi he desisted from burning the suburbs of the city in his letter he says that delhi is a mahasthal and it does not behove anybody to burn down the cities it breaks the cord of diplomacy on the other hand you find the treatment that nadir shah meted out to delhi it was a butchery by a persian invader so i would say both of the marathas was a mild one 1739 was the beginning of this extraordinary epoch that i refer to of nana sahib peshwa because by 1740 the marathas had reached the yamuna and the chambal in the north and the tungabhadra in the south and in 1740 two things happened after nadir shah's attack the mughal empire started disintegrating its peripheral provinces for example bengal it was usurped by ali wardi khan in the south the nawab of arcot thought he could appropriate the uh, remnants of the vijayanagar kingdom in uh, trichinopoly and in tanjavur so these disturbances were uh, what pulled the marathas to these areas and you find that uh, the marathas gradually began to go up to this parts now a historian in the, about 1726 has written that when nana saheb came on the scene in 1740 along aided ably by sindhya's holkar is adoro a revolutionary period comes in the history of a nation after several centuries and in india such a time came in the mid 18th century and nana saheb peshwa was at the helm of affairs at the start of this epoch so it was around this time that the marathas really started growing out of their original boundaries of uh, malwa and bundelkhand uh, can i change the slide please <clears throat> and you find that the focus shifts to the karnatic when in the same month that bajirao died raguji bhosle who was the ruler of nagpur led a large army to the south to liberate tanjavur and trichinopoly from the hands of the arakat nawab and that started uh, the occupation of uh, the karnatic by the marathas at that time you find the governor of uh, pondicherry the french governor of pondicherry an extremely ambitious who actually you find trying to who first dreamt that he could actually think of a empire for his country and it was he whose uh, first Uh, he got the inkling of this when after he had captured madras from the english a large uh, army of the nawab of arcot was chased away by about a few hundred frenchmen with their artillery with their rapidly reloading and firing guns and in 1746 this discovery for duplay was the turning point and he within a few years after that his general pussy uh, took charge of the nizam's kingdom for all practical purposes so what you find is that the script was proceeding in a certain manner towards maratha paramount sea a pan indian indigenous empire uh, this is, uh, these words are very important because it was after 800 years that a pan indian indigenous empire was coming into india an indian indigenous empire at the same time it was the last indigenous empire before the british rule started so this maratha period of about 150 years that we have between the earlier period and the mughal period and the british period is very important because it helped to reassert and to regain what the lost ground over the last 7 or 800 years now uh, in the first uh, few years of uh, the uh, maratha of the of nana saheb's uh, term you find he is very vigorous in his actions and uh, it's almost four uh, particular uh, four uh, 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 different campaigns he led to the north and uh, those four campaigns were extending from areas as wide apart as jaipur in the west delhi and bengal in the east and that is how far the marathas had by that time spread find that uh, can i have the next slide please so you find that it was at this time that the uh, real change started taking place and the marathas became a pan indian power but uh, there were so many narratives that were happening principally between the uh, rivalry of the 
European powers, the English and the French, that started in the Carnatic. And uh, it is ironical that at that point in time, you'll find that uh, the Marathas under Nana Sahib did not consider, or nobody at that point considered that these trading nations at one point could ever aspire for nationhood. And even these nations at that time probably didn't imagine what it would finally lead to. They were just looking for their own interests at that point in time. So during the 1750s, 1740 to 1760 period, there are so many narratives like the Marathas battles with the Nizam of, there are so many battles which took place, especially after 1750. The Maratha succession after the death of Chhatrapati Shahu, for nearly two to three years, Nana Sahib was completely engaged in that in the, what was happening around Satara. Then there was again the uh, rebels within his own fold who he had to put down. And for that, he not only collaborated with the French when he led, brought the uh, French general to help him uh, fight with the Nawab of Saunur in Karnataka, for example, or the Royal Navy when it came here under Admiral Charles Watson. He took its help to put, uh, take back Vijayadurga and imprison Turaji Angre, who was not listening to his orders. So at the same time, you find that in the Karnataka, the Maratha armies were going down all the way to Siranga Patnam. They were going to the uh, they defeated the Nawab of Kurnool. They were at the eastern coast of India. The Bhosles of Nagpur had already taken Odisha from uh, Nawab of Bengal. He had uh, imposed a Chauth in 1751 on Bengal. So it all appeared as if a Maratha uh, supremacy or paramountcy was kind of going uh, across without much of uh, difficulty. It was at this time that uh, the invasions from the northwest because around 1752 the Marathas had taken the responsibility of defending the Mughal Empire. This was the change which happened between 17th, the 17th and 18th century. I'm sure there'll be questions about why the Marathas protected the Mughals. We'll take, take that a little later. So in those four or five invasions that Ahmad Shah Abdali came to India, part of it was his greed for the wealth of Delhi and part of it was because he wanted, he was invited by his, uh, uh, by the Afghans who were uh, in the north, the Rohilas, who called them, called, push back the Marathas south of the Chambal and south of the Narmada, if possible. And that is where the after his initial loot in 1757-58, his uh, massacres in uh, places like Mathura and Vrindavan, you find him coming back for the fifth time. But before he came back for the fifth time, the Marathas had spread all the way to Peshawar. They had taken Atok, they had taken Multan, they had taken Lahore, and they had taken Peshawar. And Abdali's main interest lay in Punjab, his own country being an arid land. The only place from where he could really get wealth was from the Punjab. And that is where the interest between a power which was centered in Pune, 1500 miles south of the Punjab, and in Afghanistan. This was the province where the interest between the two of them really came into conflict with each other. Now, I will just say that Panipat came at a time when the Nizam had been all in the south and practically the six Ubas of the Deccan would have fallen into the Maratha lap by February 1760. It was around this time again that Abdali was marching down through the uh, Khyber and the Bolan passes, crossing the five rivers of the Punjab and uh, reoccupying the regions which the Marathas had taken. And soon he was threatening Delhi. And when the uh, armies of Dattaji, Sindhya and Mahamallara Holka were defeated around 1760 separately, that was a time when after decimating the Nizam, a large army had to go north, which was led by the hero of Udgir, there he had defeated Nizam, which was Sadashi Raubhav. And that was the time when Nana Sahib was not well, because Nana Sahib was a strategician. His presence near the battlefield, his uh, one letter, his diplomacy could probably uh, help achieve what even uh, could not be achieved great battle. And that was the time when he was ill and uh, his army went forth. And uh, at that point in time, it will take a long time to analyze what happened at Panipat. But even after that uh, setback at uh, Panipat, uh, the Marathas did not 
weakened to the extent that they lost their empire. They regained it within the next eight or ten years. And even after Panipat, when uh, Nana Sahib, as long as he was alive, he died about five months after the battle. His enemies stayed their hand. So great was his personal prestige as a, as a ruler. And it was in June 23rd, 1761, that this extraordinary epoch ended with his death. And it left his son Madhur out to face the new challenges ahead. Uh, if you have a, if you have to understand what Nala Sahib's rule really meant at that point in time, uh, the Bakhar of Panipat was written. The Bakhar of Panipat was written around a few months uh, after uh, the death of uh, Nala Sahib, and in that uh, time. Uh, he, he has given a declaration at that point, what he's wanted to say and uh, to his successor. And he says, do not abandon the righteous path or ethical conduct. The cow, the brambin and the twice born should be protected in accordance with precepts of justice. Do not indulge in lawlessness or justice. Do not indulge if uh, Hindu Marathas or Muslims behave as per the traditions of their uh, caste or community. Do not discriminate against them. The kingdom should not discriminate on the basis of each person's faith or his deity. The Bakar of Panipat, written in 1761, gives this dying message from Nana Sahib to his brother Raghunath Rao. This message appears as if it's of a moment of today. And uh, that's what we actually uh, find was the epitaph of Nana Sahib at that point in time. Now, let's come to some talk about what happened during this time, I'll come to some counterfactuals. And there are so many of them, which is uh, one way to understand uh, the impact of events as they took place at that time. What if the Marathas had not risen against the Mughals? What if Nadir Shah had, as a consequence, not invaded Delhi? What if the Europeans had not come here? What if the Battle of Panipat had gone the other way? Each of these counterfactuals can tell you the story of the 17th and the 18th centuries. Then there are several intriguing questions that keep getting thrown your way. Why did the Marathas not do away with the Mughal ruler? Why did they entrench themselves at Panipat? Why did they take women along with them? Why did they lose at Panipat? And the 500 page narrative in this book tries to explain some of these issues. Uh, cultural administrative uh, uh, points that uh, of that time, which are also discussed there. So. To sum up, I will say that we cannot address these macro questions without really addressing them in minutity. And you cannot just give a single line answer to all these questions. But I will uh, probably have to hand over to Amit now because my clock tells me that I have to seed ground. And we will go to the next stage of the presentation. So let me hand the baton back to Amit. And uh, we'll try to take the questions as they come a little later. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Uday. I think uh, you did a great job of summarizing a 200,000 plus word book with so much detail in, in 20 short minutes. Uh, and we'll try to get into some of these uh, questions uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, now let me turn over to uh, Dr. Cooper. And uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, the floor is yours. I uh, would like to hear your views both on uh, Dr. Kulkarni's book as well as, uh, as well as your book and your insights. Uh, into the into the Maratha history. Thank you. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak. I thought what I would do was to start by making some uh, comments about historiography, the history of writing history, and how that relates to the narrative history that Uday has given us. And then uh, perhaps if you want to ask me question later about things like South Asian military economy, I can I can deal with that separately. But as I say, first I want to concentrate on, on the, the history of history, or as we call it, historiography, and why that's important in the context of, of um, the, this particular book about uh, Nana Sahib. And I must apologize uh, to those of you folks who are watching this. Uh, in the sense that I uh, am not as a as well versed in terms of the use of slides, pictures, powerpoints as Uday. I always enjoy his his lectures and his his presentations because they're colorful, they're informative, and and he has the gift of being able to speak about his subject off the cuff. 
Unfortunately, I'm a much more traditional and I'm afraid much more boring speaker. So um, please bear with me, but I will give you now some observations with regard to historiography and the current uh, book that Uday has provided us. <clears throat> Narrative history, particularly that type that goes into painstaking detail, has fallen into disfavor, but it is essential to our understanding. What does that mean? Simply this, large segments of society these days want to be entertained, whether that is the result of technology's influence, meaning the movies, television, or entertainment on demand through the internet, People now often prefer to be entertained rather than to engage with the challenge of reading materials that tax their understanding. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And we have to give ourselves permission for downtime. We all deserve that. We have busy lives. But I submit to you that we are paying a collective price for what that means in terms of our understanding of the past. Now, I fully take on board that people would not readily want to read a, a big book as opposed to go see a movie, right? So if somebody said, we're going to teach you about a particular Peshwa, which would you rather do, read the big book or go see the movie? Well, I think you can understand the price we pay for that in the context of, of historic accuracy. And, and the case that I would draw to your attention uh, most recently is probably that of, of Baji Rao I and the way he was portrayed in popular film. Yes, it's true that certain aspects can be gloriously brought to life for us on the screen. But by the same token, we usually sacrifice aspects of historic accuracy when we want to be entertained by our history rather than informed by our history. Okay, so that distinction, let me repeat that, right? We, historic, historic accuracy suffers when we want to be entertained by our history rather than informed by our history. In that regard, Uday is paddling upstream with regard to the general population. I admire his tenacity in assembling his current work from a great number of historiographic sources. Within his current work, we can find a great number of extracts from letters written by Nana Saad Peshwa. These are particularly helpful in trying to catch a glimpse of this historic figure who was far more complex than many earlier histories have led us to believe. We see a political and military leader who over time becomes an astute manager of statecraft and the machinery of power, but also a very deep thinking, socially conscious leader who wishes to see greater development in the Deccan. In particular, this is revealed in his writings about the urban development of Pune. He's traveled to the north, he's seen the fountains, the parks, the water systems associated with the great cities of Hindustan, but he can also take pragmatic steps to bring the public benefits of his vision to the people of Pune by commissioning developmental works such as an urban water supply. So if one were making a movie about Nana Saib Peshwa or or in other words, if I was trying to entertain you as opposed to teach you about this particular Peshwa, I would concentrate on things like his many military campaigns across India. But if we go back to the challenge of reading historic sources and writing a comprehensive narrative, you have what is arguably a less entertaining but far more informative study of a very skillful leader who exercises judgment in both civil and military affairs. And so that, that's one of the, the reasons that, you know, Uday's work is so important, right? It brings these other facets that you might not see if you chose to, to take a more entertaining route into this material. So why didn't this type of study emerge often or more often during the British colonial period? Well, in some cases, it was simply access to the sources. British historians did not always have access to family collections, particularly Maratha family collections or original correspondence, or in many cases, they were not available in translation and not enough British authors had the ability to, to translate. And I'm extremely limited in that context. I did not learn to read Modi script or, or nor do I speak Hindi and for that I apologize. But I think if, if you can find sources in translation, you can still do a tolerable job if you're 
very careful with what I will explain in a moment. So why didn't the British evolve this type of history that, that we see Uday giving us? Well, there is another possible explanation. And although I am not one to engage in conspiracy theories, I think it reasonable to suggest that amongst British historians, there was, whether by design or practice, a subtle form of political censorship when it came to writing about Maratha history from the 1880s to the 1940s. And I think that period is very critical. Let's think about that just for a moment. During the early days of uh, Indian nationalism and later leading up to the time of independence, uh, was it really going to be in the best interest of a British uh, author to promote the history of a Hindu population that showed that it was entirely capable of wielding political and military power to the point where it can engage European authority. So while I do not, nor have I ever seen anything by way of documents to suggest there was a deliberate suppression of Maratha history, one can't help but think that certain colonial authorities would have taken a dim view of any work that sought to redress what can only be seen as the prejudicial portrayal of Maratha history. Let me give you one example in which we can see lingering negative Maratha stereotypes perpetuated from the 18th to the 19th century. Now, this is something that I did cover in some of my work, but it's, it's about misinterpretation leading to misrepresentation. And I'm going to use a particular military example as it became quite familiar to me during the course of some of my researches as long ago as 30 years. And the stereotype stems from events that resulted from the British seeking military help from certain Maratha leaders. And in particular, when the British sought to destroy uh, Tipu Sultan in the Third Anglo-Mysore War. So during the Third Anglo-Mysore War, which was fought from 1790 to 1792, the British were keen to have the Marathas as military allies. In particular, the British knew that their regular cavalry was outmatched by the cavalry of Mysore. Therefore, British military commanders saw merit in forming an alliance with the Marathas with a particular eye towards using Maratha cavalry to counter the forces and in specifically the horsemen of Mysore. Several Maratha Jagadars could see that there was a profitable opportunity to supply the British with some form of cavalry. The real chance to profit would come from an opportunity to supply cheap, easily obtained irregular horsemen as opposed to supplying them with more expensive, in effect, Maratha regular cavalry. Okay, so, so there's a chance to exploit what I'll later explain as the, the military labor market, the South Asian military labor market. In simple terms, the British thought they were entering into agreements for regular Maratha cavalry contingents skilled horsemen with fine horses and high quality equipment, well versed in how to fight the horsemen of Mysore. But some of the more entrepreneurial Maratha military leaders saw this opportunity for profit from the arrangement by accepting British payment for the high fine quality cavalry and supplying locally easily procured Pindari horsemen, many of whom arrived without regular weaponry on poorly fed ponies with no real ability to engage the Mysore cavalry on an equal footing. Some of the Pindari bands were quite criminal in nature. One unfortunate side effect of this movement was that several British observers during the Third Anglo-Mysore War saw vast numbers of fairly motley horsemen riding in the name of the Marathas. Some of those British soldiers came away thinking these horsemen were typical of Maratha forces. And we see observations did find their way into published accounts of the Third Anglo-Mysore War, right? As a result, we see references of that time referring to scampering Maratha horsemen with rather disparaging remarks made about their lack of discipline and their ragtag appearance. Unfortunately, that portrayal, as derogatory as it was, gained further life when engravings, you know, engravings and books, sketches, if you will, were made of some of the horsemen. And those graphic depictions were later circulated in popular books as indicative of the so-called Maratha army, right? So you've got the misportrayal of, of Pindaris as mer regular Maratha horsemen. And then you have the misrepresentation of these Pindaris 
as a Maratha army as opposed to irregular horsemen. In Uday's work, however, we can see a fully developed Maratha approach to military force structure much earlier in the century. This included not only conventional infantry forces, artillery and cavalry, but also he's done us a great service in his aspects of his work that speak of the Maratha Navy. Pindaris would remain a regular aspect of Maratha military operations well up until 1818, but they were auxiliaries and not the mainstay of Maratha power. Yet the engravings of the so-called scampering Maratha horsemen live on with aquatint versions showing up in the 19th century. So these are the ones, they took the original sketches, you know, that were, were made by carving into copper plates and, and, and using them on the printing press. So later on, these these pictures, when they found they could color them, they get colored and they put they get put back into more history books. So this cycle uh, of misrepresentation persists into the 20th century. So from a historiographic standpoint, we can see that a, this less than rigorous approach to formulating narrative history often relies or degenerates into a dependence upon gross generalizations made in previous narratives. So unless you get it right the first time, the chances are the mistakes can be repeated. I hope you can see in this manner that whether it was by accident or design, many of the 19th century British histories of the Marathas and specifically the histories that dealt with Maratha military power became gross generalizations that in turn were used to categorize and disparage an indigenous power. Therefore, I remain thankful for Uday who's taken the time to go back and in particular locate for us the writings of historic figures that for so long did not find a voice. And in the sweeping histories of India, these must command attention. So let me stop at that point. I'm gonna turn the floor back to Amit and other questions. Thank you. This is uh, some interesting insights. Uh, uh, learnings for me as well, uh, the British historian view in the 19th and early 20th, uh, 20th century. So now, now we will move to the uh, Q&A section. I'm going to ask questions to both uh, Dr. Kulkarni and Dr. Cooper. I, I'll, I'll, I'll go one by one, unless if it's a, a follow-up question, I'll continue with the, with the same panelists. Uh, so let me, let me start with uh, uh, Dr., Dr. Kulkarni. And I think one of the most commonly asked questions, and it still needs uh, uh, some explanation, that's why I'm still bringing it up again here, is uh, why is Nana Sahib not as well known? And I'm hoping your book will definitely <laughs> address that, or I won't say fix that, but address it. But uh, Bajirao and Madhavarao, uh, his father and his son, are a lot more well known. Uh, when, in fact, if you look at the achievements, the time period, the era, it's much longer and much more detailed. So what, what's your thought on that? Uh, <clears throat> actually, thanks for the question. But I think that the entire 18th century is an ignored century. It is. It was not very well known, and uh, because the narrative always said that the Battle of Plassey started with the uh, the British Empire started with that, and the Mughals ended around that time. And there was no place in the historiography of the times for a century which actually belonged to the Marathas. Uh, as far as Bajirao and Nana Sahib are concerned, one finds that. At least till about 20 years back, Bajira was probably equally unknown as Nana Sahib was. Because we have the government of India when it was asked to issue a postal stamp, answering, asking ki, who was Bajira. That was on his 300th birth anniversary. Coincidentally, we are now going through Nana Sahib's 300th birth anniversary. And I hope that uh, this time uh, the government of India doesn't ask the same question. Now, having said that, I think one reason for Bajirao to become very popular was this uh, Hollywood movie. However, wrongly, it was it portrayed him, and uh, it was a linear history in, in which Bajirao uh, actually dealt with. Where Nana Sahib's time, there were multiple things going on all over the place. The second reason is that uh, Bajirao led the armies, and he was a general. So there's a lot of glamour associated with uh, a person who is actually the general on the field leading the armies. Uh, which is not there in Nana Sahib's case because by the time Nana Sahib really came into his own, he was the de facto king or the de facto ruler of the Maratha state, especially after the last few years and in the 1750s. And it doesn't behoove a ruler to lead his armies. So he was the general, he was the prime minister. And by then, there were so many able people in the Maratha fold who could lead their armies out into the open and fight. 
and of course madhavrao is credited because of that famous saying that the uh, fields of panipat or nas as fatal to the maratha fortunes the death of this young Grand prince uh, famous yes. line but essentially it means because madhavrao recouped what was lost at panipat and especially after nana saheb's death within a matter of just actually just a matter of 7 or 8 years because first 2 3 years he was just getting the hang of things so i hope that uh, nana saheb's uh, contribution is recognized because it it was a very complex period he was uh, dealing with at that particular time it uh, and that is why this book has become so huge i mean so big, bigger than the earlier books right right no i think uh, yeah it is definitely much much more detailed and even the number of references are are huge Uh, a follow up question to that and this is a question that i was also discussing with dr cooper uh, to to ask you in fact and which is uh, you know uh, writing such a big vast book now i know the lockdown helped you to finish it uh, in record time but but what were the challenges and especially when you were dealing with so many different sources sometimes the sources uh, are cryptographic in nature they sometimes conflict each other you are getting multiple bakhars multiple letters multiple documents how did you sort of Pull all of that together, rationalize all of it together to put put this uh, book out. Actually, <clears throat> the period is so complex and the resources are so many that if you really want to do justice to this period and to do justice to all the sources that are available today with you, this book would have probably been double this size. <laughs> and uh, because that's the kind of resources one has, uh, because every region has got its own history. You go to the Karnataka, you have got a. a court historian of the valajai rulers of arcot and then you got english and french uh, narratives you got marathi narratives of that period and you have to pick and choose you got uh, anand ranga pille who stars, uh, maintains a wonderful diary you got duplays letters a wonderful dissertation which was published in 1933 uh, by in the for the university of massachusetts which translated duplays letters from french to english which became accessible to us so just looking at this one region karnataka the number of sources were huge so if we have to pick and choose and eventually we have to also give more credit to original letters rather than uh, third person accounts bakhars narratives written which are not contemporary so that kind of decision we had to make in bengal again there are persian sources there are mutakhrir there riyazu salatin is there there are marathi letters there are english narratives some of which later on were discredited like for example the black was written which was not really accepted later on found to be an exaggerated account writing in this particular manner so a certain background of that writer his own biases his own motives in writing that letter have to be taken into account before you decide to give the proper weightage to each source and incorporate it into your book and create a narrative out of that so it was a particularly challenging book to write from that point of view and to maintain the chronology at the same time so uh uday let me now come to uh, dr dr cooper uh, and uh, dr cooper you mentioned couple of very interesting things while uh, talking about uh, uh, uday's book uh, specifically yes. the reference to uh, the town planning of pune the development of pune city that's one of my favorite themes uh, in the book and again that's something that uh, in the with the short time uday did talk about it but that's that's something that we rarely talk uh, in history we typically talk about just battles and treaties we don't talk about the culture the urban development how people lived how the quality of life was improved uh, so that's one thing but are there any other sections of uday's book that you particularly like uh, and the uh, ones that you would like to highlight <laughs> it it's a fantastic question thanks for the opportunity it's also a difficult question because there are several uh aspects of the book that i'm attracted to and, and um let me just give you a couple of examples and i'm going to home in on one specific thing which i think underpins the of the larger theme of of this particular presentation um i'm drawn uh first of all to the the section zudai has given us on shahu um it's very uh difficult to remain unsympathetic uh to uh king shahu from the standpoint that uh, he knows that there's this tremendous burden of state upon him as a uh, direct uh descendant of uh chatrapati shivaji he he realizes he's living in his grandfather's shadow but 
by the same token, he's got problems at home. He's got problems with his wife. He's got he's got problems with Sardars who want to go wandering off and conquer new territories, and he's trying to adjudicate things like that. So that that interests me. This this very human side of, of kingship. Another uh, very uh, fascinating point for me is the the degree to which uh, uh, Nana Sahib relies on his inner circle as a form of cabinet. It's not declared a cabinet, but he also has to take into consideration balancing out family interests and, and what what are the larger dynamics of, of power. And so, for example, um, the discussions in 1760 at the summit conference, I'll call it summit conference, it is okay. recognized as a conference mm -hmm. at Padur, all right? This is the drawing together of different threads of power and how will we exercise this? And in particular, we know in 1760, he's concerned about the slippage of power in the Ganga Yamuna Dob, right? He knows that bigger things are afoot. And of course, if they don't get it right, then they can lose the region. By the same token, even to stand a credible chance of defending it, they will have to move resources there on a scale that will cause displacement in other areas of the Maratha Empire. So so both of those sections interest me. But but one more, the one I home in on, right, the Padur is near the end of uh -huh. it. But earlier in the book, coming back to the central theme here of narrative history and historiography, um, and for those of you that have a, a copy of the current book, it's on page 60. And if I had to pick one passage, it goes like this. And I quote, History is sometimes the sum total of the narratives written close to the events of the day. Sometimes it is not. And one has to read between the narratives, end quote. And I, I love that quote because Hello. it points out the work of the historian as the relentless detective, right? And, and no matter how many sources you get, it's kind of like a form of addiction, I think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Udai would, would uh, uh, disagree, maybe agree, but here's the point, right? You find these sources, and there may not be a key. There may not be a common mm -hmm. thread. So, so that's my my favorite. I think very profound line in the book. No, I think that's that's a great summary. Even I I remember that that line very well. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's, it's detective work if you have to especially compare and contrast and conflict so many different different sources. In my limited work, which is a very very small fraction of what both of you have done, whenever I read something, you're always able to find something which is completely opposite of that from a valid valid source and. Ultimately, you have to you have to judge judge it for yourself. And I'll I'll just make one more point. One of the things that I really like about Uday's books, even his earlier books, is he's presenting the facts and the sources to you. And especially in the gray areas, he is not drawing conclusions. He's just presenting the data to you and then leaving it to the user, uh, to the reader, to to draw the conclusion. And many times that's that's what uh, complex history history is. But Dr. Cooper, I I want to come back to you with one more one more question. Uh, a little uh, fast forward to uh, to your book because about uh, i think in the uh, 2003 4 time frame you wrote this excellent book that i had uh, mentioned early on in my introduction the anglo maratha campaigns of 1803 and mm. that book introduced us to the term of the south asian military economy and i think that is a fundamentally a, a concept that has not been discussed earlier and i i don't think enough work has been done on that later as well so uh, would be great to hear a little bit about uh, the book from you and specifically coming back to Uday's book, what significance does Uday's latest work hold for you in the context of that particular uh, book? So I, I guess I'm asking a two part question there. OK, um, I'm going to tackle it kind of in reverse order. Okay. I'll start with the statement that that Uday's work is important for me because it confirms the existence of the South Asian military economy. In, in the 18th century. In other words, you know, we, a, lot of, a lot of later colonial history talks about, well, the British brought industrialization to, to India. And, and you know, the, it's like, really? Oh, okay, well, it, we, we're actually presented within Uday's book uh, with a lot of evidence that the military economy is alive and thriving mm -hmm. as far back as the, the dawn of the 18th century. My book is obscure because it's an academic work. It did not enjoy a great publication run uh, and although Cambridge Press um, did promote it at the time, it's been a long time. And the South Asian military economy as a concept is is different. Um, so I'm going. I wrote in that book about the Anglo-Maratha campaigns and the contest for India. What I'm asserting in the book is that 
that this struggle really is for controlling that military economy because once you once you grasp hold of that central societal driver and also the economic side of it then then you've got the keys to the subcontinent and that in particular uh, we can see um, that later on the South Asian military economy is vital to the British once they take control of it so for example they evolve what the author Doug Pierce calls a garrison state They've, you know when you, when you put so much of society into into the labor force for the military and also urban growth which you mentioned a minute ago I mean things like cantonments etc but in the first chapter of the book I wrote about Maratha military culture and that's where I first described the South Asian military economy if you will indulge me I'll read two paragraphs sure, which sure. capture it yes yes so, this book differs from others in that it depicts Maratha military culture as directly linked to the political economy of war. Central to this chapter is the concept of the South Asian military economy. Research revealed a dynamic and vibrant economic environment with a distinct military orientation, a military economy that revolved around the ever-present possibility of armed conflict. While some would argue that the label military economy is an unnecessary subdivision of the word economy, I would point out to our contemporary institutionalization of defense economics as a formal discipline. And those of uh, in the audience who've attended a military college, perhaps in Pune would recognize this is a distinct study of military economics. Modern economic markets are characterized by trade in resources, commodities, goods and services, as well as financial products. The historic South Asian military economy was also identifiable by its component parts, human resources, weapons, logistical services, credit instruments for military financing. They all had a relative value that was in large part determined by the dynamics of the marketplace. It would be inappropriate to label this as an early military industrial complex. However, it did include manufacturing facilities and consumed resources on a pervasive commercial scale that bridged many socioeconomic divisions as well as geographic regions of South Asia. The Marathas, as active participants in this military economy, evolved a military culture that was responsive to market forces. It probably began with small Maratha warrior bands that had a societal predisposition to organizational adaptability and above all military survival. They soon took service in relatively cosmopolitan local armies, and upon consolidation, those local armies proved to be the building blocks of bigger regional armies. And in time, the regional armies began to serve more than the purpose of security forces. They became institutions of political control in one form or another. The South Asian military economy eventually evolved into a network of subcontinental power. By 1803, Dominance of that economy was a prerequisite to any serious bid for political supremacy or the balance of empire. Very, very, very fascinating. And uh, we, we probably need a separate uh, discussion on your book at some point of time as we were, as we were uh, discussing. Uh, we have about 10, 10 to 15 more minutes. Uh, so there are a whole host of questions that I have and I have received. Uh, I'm going to touch upon two or three uh, important ones. Uh, so. Uh, Uday, I think, uh, uh, and again, this is a question that uh, I had discussed with Dr. Cooper as well, so I'll, I'll put it up here. You have given us so many different books uh, on Maratha history covering different different eras, different people, right? Uh, what are your observations in terms of the dominant themes that you can highlight of the 18th century, uh, looking through all these different books and the ones that, uh, that you're working on? Uh, the 18th century was a was a century which was unlike most centuries that came before it or after it in the sense that uh, though it was dominated by the maratha power at the at the fringe of empire there was always conflict and the number of uh, players whom you see at that point in time in the indian subcontinent were quite a few the second part which you find distinct uh, uh, empire from the previous Mughals is that 
the Marathas were not as ruthless as they probably uh, could have been against their opponents in the sense that you hardly find a Maratha general who kind of uh, captures his enemy and puts him to death. He's usually put away in some fort and for some years or his attribute is taken from him, he's allowed to survive. And that requires that you know you come back again and again for a tribute the following year, whether it was the Rajputs, whether it was Hyder Ali in the south. And these kind of recurring, uh, because they probably where they went wrong was they did not impose an administration in the provinces that they uh, kind of overran. They let the local ruler continue to govern and was satisfied with some kind of a tribute. So there was a Maratha area which were direct, like in Bundelkhand or uh, Malwa or in Gujarat or in most parts of Maharashtra, some parts of northern uh, Karnataka. But beyond that, they were quite happy to not have their own administrators in place, uh, have a, a pro, kind of a proxy from whom they could uh, get parts of the revenue, the system of Chauth as such. And in exchange for which they said, either we will not raid you or we will protect you from further invasions by others. So that is one theme in the 18th century you find, which is uh, which is not there in the earlier times. Though South was not a strictly Maratha concept, they borrowed it from the Portuguese, but they implemented on a large uh, scale. And that was, I think, the central theme of the 18th century. Why, in the end, uh, the enemies after Palipat could come back because they had never been permanently put down. Right. And I think the, you briefly alluded to that, but that's a question again I'm going to ask because that comes up all the time and I have received it uh, uh, today and uh, earlier this week as well in a run up to this uh, talk. Right. And that is why didn't the Marathas, when they had multiple opportunities, depose the Nizam and uh, depose even the, the Mughal throne, even though it was a puppet, as, as you mentioned. Why was that final thing not, uh, not done? Uh, or I guess the final nail was not struck. Actually, that can be answered on multiple levels. As long as Chhatrapati Shahu was alive, uh, by because of the 18 years that he spent in the Mughal camp as a prisoner and his kind of uh, uh, emotive uh, link with the Mughals, the dying promise he gave Aurangzeb that he will not extinguish the Mughals. Even in 1739, there's a letter in May 1739 after Nadir Shah went back to Delhi. In fact, around that time, there's a talk that if Nadir Shah has deposed Muhammad Shah, uh, it's time now probably for an indigenous ruler to take the throne in Delhi. Letters being exchanged at that time that who would be the most appropriate person for that post. And although it is accepted that it will only be on the strength of Bajirao's army and his arms that such a king could take place uh, to take the throne of Delhi, the person selected for that person was the tallest Kshatriya family of that time, which was the Rana of Udaipur. However, when Nadir Shah went back, he reappointed uh, uh, Mahabad Shah as the emperor. And Shahu wrote a letter. Shahu told his Butalik to write a letter to Baji Rao that God has helped now, and I'm quoting the letter here, uh, God has helped Mahabad Shah to regain the imperial position which he had lost. And now that Nadir Shah has gone, the question arises what attitude the Maratha should adopt towards the Mughal emperor. In this respect, His Highness the Maharaja Chhatrapati wishes to impress upon you the following line of policy, that it should be our duty to resuscitate the fall, falling Mughal Empire, that the Chhatrapati does not aspire to secure the imperial position for himself, that he considers it a higher merit to renovate an old dilapidated edif edifice than to build a new one. If we attempt the other course, it would involve us in enmity with all our neighbors, with the consequence that we should be exposed to unnecessary dangers. Hence, the wisest course would be to wholeheartedly support the present regime, secure only the administrative management for ourselves as the Amir ul Umrah of the state. Now, this was the constitutional state as long as Shahu lived and it applied to the Nizam in equal measure. You could defeat the Nizam any number of times, but Shahu would always write a letter that do not extinguish his rule. Now, what, the, uh, I mean, let, again, let me, let me briefly interrupt you, but then what after, uh, after 1750? Uh, after yeah. so after Shau, 1750, uh, the, the second part of the story is that it took a few years to come out of Shahu's shadow. But even after that, when the Marathas, the Mughal emperor, at that time, the Mughal emperor was a phantom, as I said. He was a puppet. And 
it was probably in the maratha interest to pursue for the to continue with the puppet controlling the puppet than to have some rohila chief like gulam kadir come in his place and try to resist marathas uh, from controlling delhi so it was the reign of the mughals but the rule of the marathas it was a benign rule of the mughal emperor who would welcome anybody who took delhi when lord lake came and took delhi shah alam went forth and welcomed him into the red fort when mahaji shinde was there he said that please protect me please pay pay me some monthly amount to look after my family and it helped to have some kind of a puppet there secondly you must take into consideration the the logistics of a maratha par uh, shifting from their home base in maharashtra and pune even in malwa and bundelkhand going across the chambal into delhi and there even the battle of panipat for that matter was practically fought on a foreign land because the people around there were all uh, there was antipathy towards the marathas at that point right? in fact the counterfactual of panipat i am anticipating your question would be what if the battle of panipat had been fought fought south of the chambal what would have been the outcome at that point in time it could have very well gone the other way so the position at which the battle was fought the marathas were at a distinct disadvantage right and uh, as as you said right i mean these counterfactual discussions can go on and on but yes. uh, <laughs> i have to moderate the time as well i'm going to ask yes. one one question for dr cooper as well because this is a question that has come up multiple times and it did come up uh, 10 minutes back uh, in one of the live uh, facebook feeds as well and uh, basically dr cooper your previous work as you yourself mentioned is uh, academic in nature and was not widely available to the general public in india as i said i was fortunate to get your book uh, in 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 us uh, about 15 years back but is there any chance we could see you write more accessible works for the indian market uh, in future well you yeah. have a lot of fans. you have a lot of fans in india well i i'm highly appreciative of, of the fact that um, people are drawn to the book it's too bad that i uh, didn't know uh back when i negotiated the original contract with cambridge press uh if i'd known it was uh, i'll share a little story with you very quickly which i think you may find funny um at that time after i finished my uh phd and and was working uh, i had done as you indicated i taught uh, military history for the us army's rotc program for a couple of years and i had been working and working away at this great what i considered to be a great detective story in terms of not about a detective but trying to detect what is the truth here because i'm seeing all these these sources and so i thought at that time i thought well i've got a phd from cambridge if i write a good book with an academic publisher perhaps that will help me land a job as a lecturer in south <laughs> asian military history and the ideal world would be maratha military history as it turned out i did the deal <laughs> with cambridge signing away the worldwide rights but Lo and behold, there weren't that many jobs for Maratha military historians. In fact, in the West, actually, it coincided with what I would see as the de decline of Maratha studies. We, I mean, the uh, uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, about that time dropped uh, Marathi from its foreign language courses, and it disappeared from many U.S. Uh, universities as well. So bad timing, bad judgment on my part. If we had it to do all over again. I would have picked a popular publisher in India and we would be in a different place I'm sure but in terms of what's on the horizon um I'm getting to that well let's put it this way any good work on history and Uday will back me up on this you need to do your proper research I'm dying to get back to India to do more research I'm very heavily committed as far as my so-called day job until the end of the year so hopefully in the coming year i'll get a chance to return to india do some more research and next time i won't make the mistake of signing up with an academic publisher <laughs> that's uh, that's that's great to hear and we are we are we are very keen uh, to see you here in india in pune hopefully the pandemic will also be behind us in a few months and travel normal travel will resume and i think that that will be that will be just amazing you visiting here in pune uh, again as i said you know i have a lot of questions but unfortunately i have to i have to be the time manager here uh, so before i close uh, uday any last uh, i'm i'm going to give uh, uh, last comments to both both the panelists here 
Uh, Uday, any anything to close? Out? Actually, let me let me go to Dr. Cooper first, and I'll, I'll Uday, I'll give you the last word. Uh, so, Dr. Cooper, any closing comments? I think just for the general audience, I think that there there is a challenge in reading narrative history because you might pick it up and think. I'm not familiar with this person. I don't know this name. I don't know this place. And I would say, struggle on, keep reading, let it sink in. There's a lot to be gained. There's some fantastic information to be learned. I think that's a that's a great point to anyone who's interested in history and to study it, uh, study it the right way, right? Uday? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I agree with uh, Dr. Cooper that this book, anybody who tells me I want to read it, I tell him it's a deep dive into history. And uh, we have tried to make it simpler. I mean, there are so many characters because you go to different regions, you have a different set of characters. But we have tried to put their names in the beginning so that you can just quickly refer back to who was this guy if his name comes up, comes up a lot of time. And even at the point where his name comes, there is short cues to describe who this guy was. Like if I have to write Imadul Mulk, I'll always prefix it by Wazir. So that people don't have to wonder who is Imadul Mulk. Mm -hmm. So that kind of cueing is there throughout the book so that they can, it kind of is, Try to make it easier to understand and to follow. But it is, I don't think, I mean, people who read it in two days, I say hats off to them. But mm -hmm. I think it was a book which would probably take uh, 10 to 15 days if you really wanted to sink in. And if you really want to appreciate the minor nuances which uh, go into that, uh, going into the book, especially the Vakya Nari's chapters, the 10 Vakya Nari's chapters, which kind of uh, take you on a different direction, give you an insight to what life was and what kind of rule there was, what kind of justice there was. So it's a kind of composite book which tries to bring everything together, tries to make it readable. And I just hope that at least to a certain extent, I might have succeeded. Of course, I think it's definitely a book that is worth reading multiple times. And definitely, I won't recommend reading it in two days. Uh, so I think uh, we're out of time. I'm going to uh, do a short, uh, short, I guess, closing, no, no formal closing as such. Uh, once again, would like to thank uh, the Nehru Center for hosting hosting us. Uh, thank you, Amish, and uh, big thanks to Dr. Cooper and to my friend Dr. Dr. Uday Kulkarni. Uh, I'll just leave you with uh, with uh, the point that Dr. Kulkarni is working on his next book on uh, Peshwa Madhav Rao, and uh, well, I won't announce the date, but suffice to say, it's <laughs> around the corner. So do watch his Twitter timeline for any updates uh, on that book. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, good night and good evening for uh, people in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amir.